Over the past few videos, we have been exploring the most crucial part in dynamic programming, the concept of states. However, after finding the recurrence, a very useful skill is finding the way of filling the table. may be thinking, it's even worth it to implement dynamic programming solution in an iterative way instead of recursive? What's the deal? There are several possible advantages of that. One of them is that the code tends to be a lot simpler. Instead of having a recurring that is calling itself and then checking if it's present in a table or not and, and having a function and a table it just have a couple of loops and an assignment much much simpler and because of that it's less propensed to errors and easier to debug and you can also save a lot of memory if the memory that is used for the stack, the stack memory can be more valuable than the heap memory because some operating systems can have restriction when dealing with the stack. Also, it's possible to use just some section of the table for computing the answer instead of having the whole table in memory because even when you need to use the whole table, you don't need to use it at the same time. We will get more into detail in that later. In my opinion, filling the table is the easiest part about solving dynamic problem problems. But oddly enough, I have noticed that most people struggle with this part when they are first learning dynamic programming. Even to the point to prefer to implement a recursive memorization instead of a couple of loops with an assignment. I may be wrong, but from my perspective, it's very common to try to imagine the process of how the table is being filled with a given code. My main advice for that is just don't overthink it. You don't need to imagine how the table is being filled. You only need to know that during each iteration, all the values that the program needs were already computed previously. Let's check our very first example about dynamic programming. The one about the robot and collecting them. At that time, we found a recurrence. This recurrence to be precise. And I presented to you a recursive solution using memorization. Now we are going to analyze it to be able to implement an iterative solution for this. As you can see, in the right side of the formula, the values required for the arguments of max, apple, are always greater than the arguments on the left side. As you can see, in the right side of this formula, the values required for the arguments of max apple that is r and c plus 1 or r plus 1 and c are bigger or equal than the arguments on the left side so that means that in order to compute this thing over here it would be enough if we know that the positions of the table with greater row or greater column were already computed. It doesn't matter in 
which order they were filling. We only need to be sure that they were already computed when we are filling this position. Do you follow me? So a possible cause to solve it could be the following one. You should be able to notice at first glance if the order of filling the table is the correct one. Just pay attention to this thing over here. R and C and this thing C plus one, R plus one. So the lesser indexes require the greater indexes to be already computed. So that would mean that a good order would be just decreasing the rows or the columns, the indexes. In this case, it's decreasing here and decreasing here. Here is decreasing and here is a bigger one. And that should be enough to continue. This is a graphical representation of how the table is being built. At the right side, this array over here is Apple Act. And this other array over here is the table that is being computed. Now think what would happen if we swap the order of the two lines. Do this it still work or not? Try to answer that in just very few seconds. And the answer is that it still works for the same exact reason that it worked previously. That is, this indexes are decreasing and these ones are bigger than the ones on this side. If you check the animation over here, you may think that it may look a little bit different how the table is being filled and that's right, it's different. However, that's not relevant at all. And what is important is just that when one cell is being computed, the cell that it read were already computed. So I, there are many possible valid orders to fill a table. And now, what would happen if we change the order of the first loop? Like this over here. Now it's increasing instead of decreasing. Just take a few seconds to think about it. And this is how the algorithm would run if we use this kind of code over there. In this case, you can see that it's trying to use a value that hasn't been calculated just at the right. And as expected, the answer is not the correct one. Most times for filling the table, you only need to nest few loops, either in increasing order or in decreasing order, depending how the recurrence is constructed. Just take care that if in the right side there are indexes greater than on the left, then you need to compute the table position from greater to lesser. And if in the right side there are indexes lower, then you need to compute the table position from lower to bigger. Let's see another example. This is one of the oldest examples of dynamic programming. This is a little bit different than the one that we have checked before because this is about counting, not looking for an 
optimum. However, for filling the table it's very illustrative. It counts the number of ways of taking a object from a total of n objects. For example, this row is the number of ways to take zero objects from a total of three. One object from a total of three, just choose which one. Or taking two objects from a total of three, just choose which one to leave out of the set and then there are three possibilities and choosing three objects from a total of three there is only one possibility or here for example there are six possible ways of taking two objects from a total of four there is four times three divided by two now the Pascal identity tells us that if we take two numbers that are together in the same row, then the sum of both would be the number that is just below them. This is the Pascal identity. This indicates the number of ways of taking k objects from a total of n or it could indicate as well the row of the Pascal triangle starting with zero and k could indicate which number is occupied within that row starting with zero. With this identity and also taking in account that n in zero or n in n are both equal to one. That means just these ones over here or these ones over here. The first and the last element in each row of the Pascal triangle are one. How could we compute the Pascal triangle iteratively? Are you able to tell how? Just remember about the right side of the equation it has lower indexes than the left side of the equation. Feel free to pause the video if you need to think about it. This code would do the work and it's shown in the animation below how this code would fill the table. It's pretty much the same order that a human would follow if they were trying to fill the table by themselves. However, this is not the only possible order. Because, as I told you before, the indexes on the right side are lower than the ones of the left. So that would mean that if we iterate on the outer loop with the column instead of the row, it should still be working. So let's check it out how that works. Now this seems a little bit odd the way of filling the table. However, this still works perfectly. Now, this is a little bit more tricky. What would happen if we reverse the order of this one? Remember, just check this thing, but maybe with a little bit more care. And take some time if you want and it indeed works. But how you may be thinking? This is because it only takes values from the previous row. So it doesn't matter in which order the current row is being filled. 
as long as the complete previous row was already filled, the columns could be computed in any order. Now that we found a way to implement it iteratively, let's improve it by saving memory. Suppose that we only want the tenth row of the Pascal tree. Then notice that for computing the row A, we only need the information from the row A minus one. We can forget about all the previous rows before a minus one and still compute the whole row. So how could we take advantage of that and use less memory in the process? One possible way could be to just remove the entire row when it is no longer needed. The cause for doing that it could be something like this. So this is a decent enough attempt to use less memory. It only holds two rows in memory at the same time. However, it still maintains empty rows in memory. And also, this code is not very elegant. I hope you agree with me in that. And last thing on each iteration of the outer loop is asking for a new row, it would be desirable to just use the same two rows over and over again. Now, by doing it in this way, just taking the model 2 of each index, then it only uses two rows of the whole table, so we don't even need the whole table. And you can appreciate also that this code is much smaller than the previous code that was just asking for new vectors and removing the previous vectors. Originally, I was planning to add also as another example of how to save memory the solution of the Hermes problem from the IOI 2004. But I think the video would be better if we just finish right now and maybe we leave that problem for another day. And for my final talk, it's true that filling the table is not always as simple as the examples presented here. I just presented a couple of examples where a couple of nested loops increasing or decreasing and did the job, but in some cases it's not that simple. In particular in the bitmap uh, cases it may be even worth it to just do memorization and be done instead of trying to fill a table in a certain way. I think you will be able to extrapolate the concept presented here on this video to more difficult problems. And as always, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the comments below. As always, keep practicing.